Neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, or NOH, is a condition in which the body experiences a sudden and dangerous drop in blood pressure. For people with NOH, standing up can be a moment of uncertainty. On today's show, what you need to know about NOH, recognizing symptoms, how to manage your condition, and empowering patients and care providers to speak to their doctors. I'm Erica Vitrini. Access Health starts now. NOH impacts approximately 80,000 patients in the U.S. with underlying nervous system disorders like Parkinson's disease, multiple system atrophy, or pure autonomic failure. For Leon, NOH affected his life with his wife, Lorraine. Their story is coming up, but first we meet Dr. Daniel Clausen, Associate Professor of Neurology at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. NOH is a term that refers to neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. Neurogenic because the nervous system isn't working like it should, orthostatic because there is a change in position of a patient, say from sitting to standing or from lying to sitting. Hypotension, you have a sustained drop in blood pressure that's not compensated with an increase in heart rate. And that's one of the reasons why you get the symptoms that you do. I visited Leon and Lorraine at their home in Leesburg, Florida to learn more about their story. Hi. Hey, Erica. Beautiful home. Thank you. Leon. Hi, I'm Erica. Hi, Erica. Thanks for having me, both of I'm you. I'm glad you're here. I'm here with the newlyweds. <laughs> Not quite. So did I hear 27 years of marriage? Yes. So tell us your secrets. Like, What do you do together to keep this marriage going? We love to travel. So where have you traveled to? Um, all over the world. Tell me um, some of your favorites. Egypt was my favorite. Oh, wow. And Antarctica was mine. We've been all over Europe. We've spent weeks in Transylvania. and done, We've done a lot of unusual trips. So calling you active would be uh, maybe an understatement. You're really well, we, we like to do things apart as well. Uh, I like to golf. That's what keeps the marriage going strong. <laughs> <laughs> he golfs, I don't. And so what do you do when he's off and away? Well, I like to do exercise classes, and they keeps me energized. And when did you move here to Florida? 14 years ago. And this was when you retired? For retirement. Right. For retirement, right. yeah. okay. Are you happy here? Oh yeah, we love it here. We've got great friends, good neighbors. Mm -hmm. Can't complain about much. Yeah, and I hear five years ago there was a little bit unexpected twist. Yeah, unfortunately it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you'd like to hear a little bit more about it, we can go sit, go sit and talk. Let's go talk, let's okay. chat a little bit. Okay. Symptoms of NOH can be challenging and can vary from person to person. Patients may experience dizziness, lightheadedness, passing out, feeling faint, inability to think clearly, and more. It's important to speak to your physician if you're experiencing any of these symptoms. These symptoms are really troubling to a lot of patients. You may feel like your legs are gonna give way. You may feel unstable with your posture. You may feel dizzy or a little bit lightheaded and you have to kind of hold on to something. Maybe you're a little fearful of falling. It's important to remember that NOH, while we talk about it as a problem with blood pressure related to posture, when you're lying down, we also refer that to as supine, your blood pressure can sometimes be too high. So supine hypertension can be a symptom also of NOH. It's important to know that you don't have supine hypertension because you need to manage that with your physician if you do. About five years ago, you start to feel different. There's a change. Tell me about what you were feeling. Well, there were a couple of things going on. Uh, one, I was being told to pick my feet up when I walked, and I just thought- By who, by you? <laughs> we would go walking together, and I'd be, can you pick your feet up? You're gonna wear your shoes out. <laughs> and then in addition to that, I was getting dizzy, or I, I called it at the time lightheadedness. Mm -hmm. And the other one was occasional dizziness when I would stand up. Mm. It would depend upon the activity on what I was doing. And when did you notice, uh... This is, a, this is a little unusual. I've got to start paying attention. It really sort of crystallized on a, on a cruise that we took. Mm -hmm. The rain talked me into going shopping off the cruise ship. And when I got off the boat and we're down shopping, I got really dizzy mm -hmm. and had to sit down. That was the worst that I had had up to that point. So then at what point do you decide it's time to see a doctor? Well, I sort of was the one who pushed that because about a month after the Caribbean cruise, we were on a trip and we ended up in Paris. We walked to the Eiffel Tower, which was not that very far to go, and he struggled a little, but 
On the way back, he just could not make it. He's, we only had to go one stop to get back home. He said, we need to take the Metro. I knew at that point he really needed to check out what was, what was happening. So you go to see the doctors, and what's the plan? I went to my general practitioner, and then he suggested making appointments with three other specialists, because we don't know what's causing it. Mm -hmm. So there was the heart specialist, an endocrinologist, and a neurologist. This was a journey. Yeah. So Leanne, you see the cardiologist, nothing. You're on to the endocrinologist, nothing. Nobody at this point can pinpoint why you're feeling lightheaded. What's next? Well, I go back to my general practitioner, and we discuss the results from those two. And he says, let's go check with the neurologist. And uh, she said, walk down the hallway for me. And I did that, and she said, you have Parkinson's. Just like that? She could tell by the way I was walking. So they determined that you have Parkinson's, but they haven't addressed the lightheadedness yet. So in order to do that, she said, uh, we we'll need to take your blood pressure in three positions. And when we did that, we found out that the blood pressure readings laying down were uh, the highest. When I stood up, it dropped tremendously. And so it was at that point, she says, you have something called NOH. NOH. I've never heard of it. Right. And so here we are, like, slammed because we were totally unaware that he had Parkinson's, but now he's got two separate things. And what are your concerns at this moment? Are you more concerned with the Parkinson's, the NOH, or? I'm more concerned about the NOH. Hmm. The dizziness is affecting me more. And so what are your thoughts before you leave that appointment? How can I manage it? How can I manage it? Even to the point of asking the question, can it be managed? Coming up, more with Leon and Lorraine and how NOH can be diagnosed. Welcome back. Time to talk diagnosis of NOH. So as a clinician, I'll diagnose NOH first by listening to the story. I wanna hear about what symptoms you're having. Second, I can do some simple blood pressure assessments. So what I may do is have the patient sit down, take a blood pressure, have them stand up, take a blood pressure again, have them remain standing for another couple minutes and take another blood pressure. And I'll be able to look at that change in blood pressure with a change in position and ask, does it drop? Does the heart rate not compensate for that drop? And if that's the case, that may be enough for me to diagnose NOH. There's a third way too. I can actually send for what's called a tilt table assessment. And this is a formal assessment where you'll lie on a table and that table will change in position and we'll check the blood pressure with that change in position. So NOH and Parkinson's is the diagnosis. What was your reaction, Lorraine? Uh, total shock. Seriously, we, we just stood there and thought, oh no, our lives are changed forever because mm -hmm. this sounds really bad. Mm -hmm. What were some of your fears in relation to, to NOH? Uh, that my life was going to be changing drastically. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, here I am. I've had 10 good years of retirement, and all of a sudden, it's over. Is that how you were looking at it? Were you looking at it like, I have NOH, things are over? Uh, initially, I think that that's what I was mm -hmm. viewing. And uh, I like to play golf every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was at a play. Point. Now, if I'm getting dizzy, am I ever going to play again? Mm -hmm. How will my life change? It seemed unfair at the time. If you could explain a little bit what it feels to experience NOH. The dizziness is by far the most important one to me. I spend an awful lot of time saying, are you okay? <laughs> because mm -hmm. I, I read his body language a lot. I've learned to recognize the look of um, fear on his face, and, and, and that's all I could describe it as is fear because it looks like he's afraid that he's gonna fall. Are you afraid? I'm afraid I'm gonna pass out. I'm afraid I'm gonna fall, right? Yeah. So trying to find a place to sit because once right. he sits, it brings the blood pressure. I look up. for a comfort zone. Some place where you feel yeah. safe. Yeah. I do get a, uh, what is called a coat hanger effect. Mm -hmm. which is uh, an uncomfortableness running through my neck and shoulders. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when he's having a bad day, a little bit of the mental mm -hmm. um, alertness is, is subdued. Mm -hmm. Which I would never admit to. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. Symptoms of NOH often affect one in five with Parkinson's disease, four out of five with multiple system atrophy, and nearly 100% of people with pure autonomic failure. Your underlying neurological disease will increase the likelihood that you need to be screened. 
Screening doesn't have to be complicated. It could be simply getting your blood pressure when you're sitting down and when you're standing up and you're standing up for a little bit longer. The problem is that these symptoms can be really troubling to patients. And so you really have to force yourself to talk to your clinician about these symptoms to make sure they understand that these are symptoms that are really causing problems. So how was the NOH affecting your day to day? And I love to play golf. I would play it every day if I could. And it was affecting just standing around waiting for my turn to putt, my turn to tee off. I was getting dizzy. I would then try to hide that from the people I was playing with. Mm. I would kneel down, because I found out that when I knelt down, the dizziness went away. You also mentioned, I know how much you love to travel. Was that ruled out as well? Not 100% of the, of the travel. Big trips were certainly curtailed. Yeah, um, we were still, from the very beginning, we were still able to travel internationally. But in the last two years or so, we've cut that out totally because it's just too difficult to maneuver airports in foreign countries. We had a bucket list of things we still wanted to travel to, and we had to give that up. NOH requires its own diagnosis. Dr. Clausen emphasizes that it's important to manage NOH along with your nervous system disorder. NOH is its own system that we need to manage and you need to tell your physician about it so that we can help you the best of our ability. You may go to see your doctor and you're focused on your tremor or on your slowness of movement and you don't realize that the NOH symptoms you're having are equally as important, if not more important sometimes. After the break, the impact NOH has on patients. I'll be right back. A recent survey of patients and caregivers reported that 87% of patients said that their NOH symptoms had an overall negative impact on their ability to perform daily activities. In that same survey, up to 53% of patients with NOH have reported reducing or stopping daily activities due to their symptoms. 60% of patients agreed that they often hide or minimize their NOH symptoms. I see a lot of patients and caregivers who tell me how limiting NOH is on their lifestyle. And there are a lot of patients with NOH, that that fear really limits their activities of daily living. Caregivers often talk about their loved one being isolated or less likely to be socially active because of these symptoms. So did it start to limit you? And oh, not yeah. just golf, but just I'm imagining day-to-day -day life. Any task that involved waiting in a line I had to really concern myself with. I had to really plan ahead and then I didn't realize it at the time how many different lines there are that I have to deal with in the world. I had to look for a way out. A way out way out of the line. Mm -hmm. And so I can imagine that even in the house, I mean, we're, we stand all the time. This must have changed the dynamic between the two of you as well. I had to take on a lot more responsibility. Did you stop doing laundry and vacuuming? <laughs> yes. uh, yeah, maybe 27 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and all the little things just to keep life going, as well as even just going out with friends and the activities we can do there. So how does that make you feel having so much fall on Lorraine's shoulders? Guilty. Yeah. As Leon will tell you, you have good days and you have bad days. Mm -hmm. And you can't determine right away what, if it's going to be a good day or bad day because it could start out good and get bad or vice versa. So, can you describe to me a good day versus a bad day? What does a that feel A good day like? is if I don't have dizzy spells from standing up. That's a good day. That's a good day. And it happens. And a bad day? I get dizzy frequently. And you're still not telling any of your friends or family? No, but they, they see something's going on because I'm kneeling when I should be standing. Yeah. I'm always sitting in my golf cart when I can. So you were diagnosed with both NOH and Parkinson's disease. How would you compare the symptoms of both? Yeah, for me, the NOH is much worse. I don't exhibit many of the traditional Parkinson's characteristics. That, that's more of the challenge, I think. The NOH is a factor that guides what happens from day to day. But you're still playing golf, you're still traveling. You seem to have found a way around it. I was active before the diagnosis of, of NOH, and I want to stay active after that. I just have to do it in different ways. It's important for patients and caregivers to recognize their symptoms and know that they can be managed. It's really important that you stay hydrated. We also talk about liberalizing your salt because that can sometimes be helpful in expanding your blood volume. And I encourage caregivers to make sure that their loved one is getting structured exercise, compression stockings, abdominal binders. These are things that increase blood pressure. There's some other things that are important too, like when you lie down, 
keep the head of the bed elevated at least 30 degrees because that can reduce some of those symptoms that we talked about earlier of supine hypertension. It's really a discussion with your physician. You want to work as a team to come up with other management strategies that may be useful to you. So then how did you begin to understand how to manage this condition? Well, in the beginning, we thought that the NOH was actually a part of Parkinson's, that they weren't two separate conditions. Mm -hmm. And once we learned about that a little more, talking to the neurologist and you know getting more information, then I think that helped Leon moving forward with it. So Leon, you mentioned that you were determined to understand how to manage your NOH. Do you feel like you've been successful? I do. I try to stay active and doing the things that I did before, I just do them in different ways. I uh, purchased a stationary bike, so I have that in my home. I ride it daily. I go for walks in the pool instead of out on the trail. And as a couple, we have a monthly community dance, and so we go to that, and even though we aren't doing fast dancing together, we do do slow dancing, so he gets exercise that way too. So NOH has not completely stopped you from traveling, correct? You've, you've found yeah. a way around it. My way of around it is I bought a scooter. It's an electric scooter, and so I can use it. When we go to museums, we do a lot of museum looking now, so I'm able to use the scooter to get around the museums. We can do road trips that way so that we get to see the country. It took me a while to convince him to utilize wheelchairs mm. to get from, you know, check-in to the gate, and that is a necessity now. So we're still able to travel, and it may look a little different than it was before, but we managed to do it. You haven't given up on all your plans? Not yet. No. So Tommy, what does your day-to-day -day look like now? So I still play golf. I do that between two and four times a week. We go to the pool whenever I can. Those are days that I'm feeling really good. On days that, that, aren't, that aren't that great, we might just sit around and watch a movie. So things are different, but they're still good. Yeah, we make things work. Welcome back. As we saw with Leon and Lorraine, both patients and care providers can take an active role in their health by recognizing NOH symptoms and having an open dialogue with their healthcare provider. My advice to patients is don't become isolated. Do what you can to get the support you need. That may include physicians, it may include therapists, it may include family members. But as you get your care team around you, there's optimism that you can be active, you can be engaged in your community through the appropriate management through your care team. So five years after diagnosis, how are you feeling now? Well, I was startled at the beginning, upset, surprised, and acceptance has occurred. I know that I've got this, I know that uh, I've got to deal with it. I do a number of activities that help me keep active, and uh, I look forward to the future. And how about you, Lorraine? Well, I think that the acceptance is a big part of overcoming the daily challenges. I mean, there are challenges, and that's undeniable, but I think that, you know, working closely with his doctor and getting more and more information about NOH and how it does affect you and what you can do about it has really helped, so we're on a good course. And do you have any sort of words of advice for anybody who has been diagnosed with NOH? The, your Bad days aren't always going to be bad. Your bad days can turn into good days. Your bad moments can turn into good mo moments. And from the care provider, any words of advice? Well, there are lots of good sites out there that will give you um, hope as well as information. And we have done um, the NOH Matters website. And we also belong to Parkinson's um, Foundation and the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Determination, right? Right. Just look for the best of every day. You take it one day at a time, and that's the best you can do. Don't give up, right? <laughs> Never give up. Never give up. I want to thank Dr. Clausen for his time educating us on NOH, and Leon, of course, and Lorraine for sharing their story. If you or someone you know has a nervous system disorder and are experiencing any of the symptoms we've discussed today, make sure to speak to your healthcare provider. For more information on NOH, visit nohmatters.com. And of course, if you've missed any part of this discussion, you can visit our links at our website, accesshealth.tv. We'll see you next time.